Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, uh, which organized tonight's event. And uh, there have been over 800 programs, I think, by now since the pandemic began, and we're just starting to get audiences back here in the club. We have a live audience here tonight. Um, our guest is Richard White. He's the author of Who Killed Jane Stanford? Uh, a murder mystery, but it's also, I mean, it's a more than 100-year-old murder mystery, but it's also a, a very fascinating story about 19th century San Francisco at the end of the century and the beginning of the 20th century was like, what the founding of Stanford was like, what the Stanford family was like, a lot of detail that doesn't quite match the, uh, the myth. <laughs> the story, yeah. <laughs> so so um, why don't we start, uh, Richard, with, um, well, first, you've done a lot of books. You're a historian. You've written a lot, a lot of books. Um, how did you pick this topic to, to, to delve into? Well, um, partially, I mean, totally. It came from a class that I taught. I wanted to teach students to um, use the archives. And one of the best ways to get students interested in the archives was to find an interesting story. And there's not many more interesting stories than that the founder of your university was murdered. <laughs> and so once I had that, and I also, by that point, there'd been enough work done that I knew, in fact, the murder had taken place. But Stanford um, never acknowledged the murder. Stanford until the present day. It doesn't say much now. But into the early 21st century, even as the evidence mounted up, it would never say that founder Jane Stanford had been murdered. So I told the students, why don't we go into the archives and why don't we see what we can find? Um, I said, I'm not going to give you an answer. At that time, I had no idea who had murdered her, though I was convinced she'd been murdered. But I said, I'll even leave the murder open. If you don't think you, she's been murdered, you can follow that through, too. And I set them off by sending up some sources, but mostly I wanted them to find sources. And the time I knew the class would be a success is one of the things that's in the archives is her death mask. Um, she's at the end of the place where when somebody died, they would make a plaster cast to the face. And I still remember that first class, we're sitting in a room in the library, the archivist comes in, he brings out a box, he empties the box, and there is Jane Stanford. Um, there's her death mask from the day after she died, staring at the students, and there was an audible gasp. And from that point on, um, they became entranced. And what surprised me is I did too. I mean, at first, I didn't think I would care that much who murdered her. Mm. But mm. by the end, <laughs> it was keeping me awake at night. So it ended up taking up three years of my life trying to figure this out. Um, well. We're not going to keep you all awake at night. Uh, if you read the book, you'll find <laughs> out uh, who the most likely suspect is. Um, but what we want to talk about is, first, you know, in your book, it's not at the beginning, but in your book, you, you quote Ambrose Bierce, Bierce as uh, working for an o Oakland paper as a columnist. In describing Leland Stanford, he said, Leland Stanford did more to corrupt California politics than any other five individuals. Is that an exaggeration or, 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 or because what's, what's Leland Stanford's background? So we'll start with the father and talk about him a little bit. Yeah. Leland Stanford um, started out in upper, upstate New York. Um, he became a lawyer. He came west with the gold rush. He pretty much failed at most everything till he came west. And when he came to the gold rush, he failed at that too. His brothers were a success. He inherited the store because they went off to do other things. But he was a storekeeper in Sacramento and he fell in with Collis P. Huntington. Collis P. Huntington um, was a nasty man. He was not an honest man, but he was a very able man. And what he did is he found partners in Stanford, other storekeepers, Mark Hopkins, Charles Crocker. They became known colloquially as the big four. But Huntington is the brains. And what they did is they pooled all their money, which they didn't have much. They got subsidies from the federal government. They ended up um, 
cheating the stockholders, the original stockholders who were few, cornering the stock in the Central Pacific Railroad. But the mistake they made, because they came to hate each other, was that they pooled their money and nobody could get out without the consent of anybody else. You could not divide up the funds. So Leland Stanford was the great beneficiary of that. Huntington made them rich and Leland Stanford came along with the ride. He had no business sense, but what he was pretty good is at politics. Huntington got him elected governor of California. And after that, what he was was the man who managed politics in California for first the Central Pacific and then the Southern Pacific. So what he did was do more to corrupt California politics, which were incredibly corrupt in the late 19th and early 20th century as any man alive. Yeah, and he was successful at that. Uh, that, that part, that, <laughs> that and racehorses. He also was incredibly good at um, raising trotting horses, one of the best in the, in the country. And the other thing, he was a good father. Yeah. And Jane, what, what, what was her background, the wife uh, that we'll be talking about? Jane Stanford um, was his wife, and he, she had to stay behind in New York for two years. There's a two-year gap in their marriage. She finally comes back out. And she's going to have a child in late middle age when they, not late middle age, early middle age by our standards, when they'd given up hopes of having a child. So he, the son, Leland Stanford Jr., becomes the light of her life. They just dote on him. They're very rich parents. They treat him more like... Um, a companion than like a child. And she herself does very little at that stage in her life besides um, take care of Leland. She, her own purpose is with Leland. She travels with Leland. She helps educate Leland. Um, and Bertha Berner, who becomes her maid, who will come to it, her companion, says at one point in astonishment, because she to, had to work her whole life, that um, for, 20 year, or for 14 or 15 years, Jane Stanford did nothing. I mean, all she did was be rich and take care of her child, which isn't like a mother raising a child because the house is full of servants. So Jane Stanford devotes her whole life to Leland Jr. And when Leland Jr. dies, she is absolutely crushed. That's what turns her towards spiritualism. And, and he dies at 16 or something like that? And they're abroad. He's 15, yeah. 15. He's 15 abroad in Italy. All right. So uh, the son that everything was going to go to is no longer... And they conceived this idea of creating a university in his name. Yeah, they, um, there's a variety of stories. I talk about them in the book. But, it's, but essentially, Leland Stanford is um, conducting a death watch over his son. It's clear that his son's going to die in this hotel room in Italy. And um, Leland Stanford dozes off. And his son, Leland Jr., actually dies while he's dozing off. And Leland Stanford has a dream. And his dream is, is that his son appears to him and says, what you have to do is um, use the money that would have gone to me and found a university to help all the children of California. This story is, is that's the, the true story, as far as I can tell, of all the various um, apparitions that, that are accounted for or used to account for Stanford University. So they, they become devoted to this idea. They're going to found a university which be, will become a memorial to their dead son. The name of the university, as some of you may know, is not Stanford University. It's Leland Stanford Junior University. It is named after the dead child. And uh, the parents, Jane and Leland, were not highly educated and uh, interested in education prior to that point, basically, or even after that point, much? Not, not <laughs> much. They're, they're not highly educated. He'd gone to law school, but this is the late 19th century. It doesn't mean that much to go to law school in the late 19th century. You read law with a lawyer. Um, and Leland Stanford had a library, had a book collection, because that's one of the signs of good wealth, great wealth. But as um, Bertha Berner said, he mostly used the library for naps. Um, <laughs> He, he was not Bertha Bernie said a great reader. And what he wants to do is set up Stanford University as a practical university. Um, what he means by that is never really clear, but he wants to hire a faculty. And he finds out that hiring a president away from Eastern universities to Stanford University, despite his money, is not easy. He fails four or five times before he finally hires David Starr Jordan and will turn over the actual operation of the university um, to Jordan while he takes care of the money and the other aspects of, of the university. So we have a picture of David Starr Jordan. Yes, it's great. Yeah. Perfect, Spencer. Um, and this character is a very important character in the, the whole story of what happened. 
So he is the first president of Stanford University, right? He's the first president of Stanford University. And, he, and he's president for how long, 20, 25 years? He's president from his founding till about 1914. And, it's, yeah. and Herbert Hoover, the story is Herbert Hoover fires him. Um, uh -huh. He fires him abruptly. Um, Jordan shows up for graduation, and Hoover makes an announcement that he's so proud that David Starr Jordan is going to become chancellor of Stanford University, which is news to, Stanford, to David Starr Jordan. <laughs> he's no longer president of the university, a position with some power. He's now chancellor, which supposedly is higher, but has no power at all. So he's gone. So is this the first uh, experience of someone getting kicked upstairs like that, or was that, was that, <laughs> or was they, that already they, well in place? They were well in place. By <laughs> then. Um, so that, that time when he got kicked upstairs was already nine years after the death of Jane Stanford. So uh, he, he managed, uh, first managed to work under Jane Stanford because Leland Stanford died how long into the university's founding? Just a couple of years, right? Leland Stanford dies, I think, in 1892, so soon after the university's founding. Jane is going to run the university from 1892 to 1905. And Jordan will be the president, but Jane keeps a tight control over the finances of the university. She is the power. Um, Jane Stanford, everybody works for Jane Stanford. Her Lathrop relatives, um, her brothers work for Jane Stanford. Um, Jordan works for Jane Stanford. Her servants work for Jane Stanford. The faculty works for Jane Stanford. Jane Stanford sees her power, as Bertha Berner says, is in her money. Um, everybody she is close to is dependent on her for their salary or for an inheritance, and she never loosens the reins on that at all. Now, you mentioned Bertha Berner a few times. She is like a personal assistant, but more than that, to Jane Stanford for for many years. Bertha Berner will write um, a biography of Jane Stanford. So for a long time, the only information you really had on Jane Stanford was filtered through Bertha Berner. Um, Bertha Berner starts out as a secretary, but really becomes a companion, um, and is a companion to Jane Stanford until her death. Now, if you read Bertha Berner's memoir, Bertha Berner and Jane Stanford were um, close together from when Berner was about 19 years old to when Berner is in her late 30s. When you go back in the records, as I did, you find out that there are large gaps in that record. Bertha Berner quit or was fired numerous times and was brought back. Their relationship was much more volatile than you'd ever know from reading Bertha Berner's memoir. Yeah, she edited that among other things. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let's go back to the family now. The, the father dies. The son is already dead. So Jane is now alone. She has this pile of money. Well, Jane's never alone. Never alone. Yeah. <laughs> but her family. And she, she gets more involved in spiritualism. Ironically, her, the, one of uh, Leland's brothers is also into it, too. Yeah. So it's, it's in the family. It's, um, the reason I said that Jane's never alone is she makes it very clear that her two leading advisors about how to run the university are her dead husband and her dead son. And for reasons I can figure out, it might be the newspaper story, she said they never show up together. Um, one shows up for a week and then the other comes for a week. But she says she's in constant contact with them, um, that they are always there, always giving her advice. She does not know what she would do without them. At the same time, Leland's brother, Thomas Welton Stanford, who's gone to Australia, made a fortune of his own. Um, and as, as I was saying, you know, I was telling George, if you had a lineup and you had to pick the spiritualist out, this would be the guy. Um, you can see him, and that's how, that's not the photograph, that's how he looked, those eyes staring ahead. He, he's a spiritualist because his wife died, not, his, not a child died. His wife died, and he spent um, the rest of his life getting in touch with her, and he becomes one of the most prominent spiritualists in Australia and indeed in the world. And Jane Stanford, on a, her la, her, on a round the world trip, will stop in in Australia and get from Thomas Welton Stanford, he'll have seances, Berner gives one account of that. There's a very different account from other people who were there. But they share this spiritualism, a deep bond of spiritualism. And indeed, he endows a chair at Stanford, which is to investigate spiritualism. It was, his first, it was the first chair in the psychology department is devoted to um, getting in touch with the dead. Yeah, we're going to go into that in a second. <laughs> but see this picture here of, of uh, Thomas. You know, I, I just, when I saw it, I just imagined Rasputin at the age of about 10 years old, seeing that picture and saying, I want to be him. <laughs> you know, that's 
For those of you who, who, who are only listening to the podcast, you have to look up a picture of Thomas Welton Stanford. Um, so you mentioned about spiritualism now and, and that it was an endowed chair in psychology. Uh, Stanford University and the memorial chapel that was built and the stone monuments, you can talk a little bit about that to the uh, Stanford family. Uh, that was an attempt to make Stanford uh, not a secular university, but a spiritualist university. Yeah. Jane, Jane takes over Stanford and she begins to mold the university in a, in a different direction than Leland would have taken it, though he himself dabbles in spiritualism. And what you can see if you go to Stanford today, where the memorial arch right there is, the arch is gone. It came down in an earthquake, but what's still there is the foundation stone for the arch. And you will see a memorial that's going to be to Leland Stanford Jr. And it uses a phrase that you can see walk read, walk by, pay no attention to it. It says, born into mortality, and that's his birth date, passed into immortality. That's the date of his death. That's every spiritualist in early 19th century, late, early 20th century America would have known what that meant. And it's the same thing as when you go through the chap or the church, on um, the church you can see behind you, which is very different from the modern church. That steeple came down, the church was wrecked in the earthquake. Um, and that if you go through there, as I had my students do, you will find Jane Stanford had a series of spiritual sayings which she had engraved on the um, sides of the church. Many of them are conventional Christianity. Others are spiritualist sayings. There are spiritualist symbols all over the church. You only know these things if you know what you're looking for. Otherwise, it passes very easily into an ecumenical, spirit, ecumenical Christianity. The other thing you'll notice there is that statue, which is still in the Stanford campus, but now it's down by the mausoleum where the Stanfords are buried. But originally, when you pass through the Memorial Arch, which showed the coming of civilization to California, led by the Stanfords, she's riding side saddle, he has a pith helmet on. You would then pass to the Stanford family, and then you would have pass to the church, which you can't see it here, has engraved in the, in the um, front of the church, it says, um, to the memory of my dead husband, Leland Stanford, and to our Lord God, Jesus Christ, um, except Leland Stanford gets much higher billing than Jesus <laughs> Christ. All of these things came down. Jane Stanford had a lot of memories, uh, enemies, excuse me, she had a lot of memories too, but she had a lot of enemies. And her sister-in-law says she treated the earthquake of 1905, which destroyed all the memorials to the Stanford you see there, as divine retribution. She had, she had a lot of enemies. When I started this, I thought it's going to be hard finding anybody who'd want to kill her. My problem was the opposite. There were so <laughs> many people who wanted to kill her. <laughs> not not who done it, but why didn't everybody do it, right? <laughs> yeah, quite a different story. Well, it's it's a, a, a great look, and, and say a little bit more about this arch. That was a huge arch that was built, and a lot of money was spent on it. And I'm sure that the that, that the faculty uh, with their small. I mean, I remember I worked at a Boy Scout camp when I was uh, you know 14, 15, and they put a new arch in at the entrance, and it was made out of California redwood. This is out in Wisconsin. It made out of California redwood. We found out it cost $1,000, and we were all getting $15 a week. <laughs> you know, it, it, it disturbs the faculty. <laughs> you, yeah, you, you would have made a good faculty member at the 20th century Stanford. This is, David Starr Jordan refers to this period in Stanford's history as the Stone Age. Um, the money does not go into education. It does not go into faculty salaries. It does not go into research labs. It goes into a monument to the Stanfords, which got noticed. Um, you know, Charles Eliot, the president of of Harvard said that it was hard not to regard Stanford as a way to whitewash the Stanford fortune. It um, was a memorial to the founding family gotten founded with ill-gotten gains, is the way he described it. So Stanford is, at the time, searching for respectability, but nationally it has a reputation as a sketchy university. Um, Jordan is trying to increase its reputation but then as George said, Jane Stanford is taking it in more and more spiritual directions. Uh, and, and, and David Starr Jordan isn't exactly an exemplary figure either. I mean, he, he's president of a university that the, uh, at least the aspiration is to become the Harvard of California, et cetera. They, they kind of did that right from the start. Um, but the Eastern schools, uh, the professors and the, and the administrators, even though they were offered lots of money, 
did not really want to come and join. Yeah. Right? And they wouldn't come partially because of Jane Stanford, but partially because of David Starr Jordan. Um, the faculty who survived were very loyal to Jordan because, in fact, they became a clique around him. But if, in fact, if you disagreed with Jordan, um, Jordan would cost you your career. And Stanford is going to have a series of scandals in which Jordan drives out professors, some of whom have been very close to him, some of whom Jane Stanford initiates, but others Jordan initiates. So what by, the, by 1904 and 1905, most faculty across the country, when they try to recruit them, they see Stanford as a kind of autocracy. Um, Jane Stanford controls the money. David Starr Jordan controls everything else. Academic freedom is a sort of afterthought if it exists at all. And if you don't please Jane Stanford and you don't please David Starr Jordan, there's no place for you at Stanford University. Stanford University should be very happy that it turned out the way it did with that kind of childhood, you know. <laughs> <laughs> because, because it really, I mean, it, it has become exactly what they had hoped, but, uh, but other, other university presidents must have taken it in hand and changed it. Modern Stanford is a creation of World War II. I mean, Margaret O'Mara's book is very, very good on this. But what makes Stanford University is going to be federal money pouring in after World War II and, it, and turning it into a technical university of a kind that Leland Stanford sort of imagined, but it was nowhere near that for most of its history. So uh, anyone that cre wants to create an institution and it's not going well for the first few years, just you know, imagine a few more decades and something else might happen and it might, might actually turn out. Because it, it's, it's one of the great ironies, I think, of the story is that the, the way that it, it, it got started, you would never have expected it to turn out yeah. well. <laughs> but but the, the other part, which is not to give away the mystery, but right. one of the reasons why um, Jane Stanford is, her death is not something that all people in the university mourn is she never really let loose of the um, purse strings. She controlled the money up until the end, even though she had founded a series of trusts. But the, the trusts that founded Stanford were so poorly written, and you can go back and look at it. One of the amendments to the California Constitution is an amendment that simply legalizes Stanford University. Mm -hmm. Because all the financial arrangements, all of the ways in which it was organized were illegal under California law. So they had to amend the Constitution to make Stanford legal. It's one of the interesting characters in your book. I think George Crothers is involved yeah. in this. Yeah, I think I have the right one. Um, that he, he sounded like, like a quintessential lawyer. That is, he knew what he wanted the outcome to be. He knew that to get there was not going to be a straight path. Um, and he was juggling the whole time between President Jordan and, and, and uh, Jane. Um, and he kind of got his way uh, by getting that uh, yeah. amendment in the California Constitution. They were, she wasn't supposed to give away more than a certain percentage of her wealth to the university, and she ended up, you know, they ended up getting a lot more, but that's also part of the story about the yeah, death, that, right? that becomes the story, too. I mean, yeah. the point where, um, when I first went into the Crothers papers, um, I knew I'd hit a gold mine for a couple of reasons, one of which, I'm a historian, and historians are not neat. When another historian has gone through an archival collection, things are out of order. They're not put in right. They're marked up. I went into Crothers' collection. It was like a brand new deck of cards. Um, <laughs> nobody had really looked at this very closely. And the other thing I noticed is Crothers kept memoranda. And he kept memoranda starting in the 1890s, going through until the 1940s. He lived a very long life. So Crothers was the man who knew where all the bodies were buried. And it was in the archives, much of it all the time. But that's the problem with keeping a secret. You keep a secret too long, it's too late to reveal it. <laughs> the stuff is there. Um, and that, that was one of the most useful collections I found. So let's set up the, you know, before we go to the, to the actual uh, personal relations and the murder and stuff like that, let's set up the finances, which had such a big influence. So you made it perfectly clear that Jane held the purse strings very tightly and Jordan held the faculty very tightly. So um, the money was set up in trusts. Everybody knew that Stanford would only survive as a university if, that, if a big chunk of money was released eventually. And of course, she was older, and so they expected it. Um, but there we are. We have a very difficult set of, of wills, and, and, and they have to be cleared up and everything like that. So they're living on tenterhooks the whole time about is, is our university going to survive? And now they're uh, 1905, I think we're talking about, when, when the, yeah. the series of poisonings took place. And 
so it's, it's been around for more than 15 years. And, and here it is. Uh, they still really don't know what, where the money's going to come from. No. And Crothers did a good job. But Crothers knew that, in fact, he'd set up a problem. By cleaning, clearing things up, the Lathrop family could argue that George Crothers had gotten more money to Stanford because of his undue influence over Jane Stanford. And Crothers was terrified that that was going to be one challenge to the wills and to the trusts. The other challenge to the trusts and wills was going to be that Jane Stanford said openly. She consulted with her dead husband and her dead child. Um, ghosts do not have legal standing. This, <laughs> this could be the kind of thing which could open up another challenge to the wills and trusts that Jane Stanford was not in her right mind when she drafted these documents. Jane Stanford also changed wills constantly and did some extraordinary things. At one point when the government was suing and she was afraid they were going to lose the entire endowment, she signed the whole endowment over to one trustee, which was extraordinary. You've just taken the endowment of your university and given it to somebody. What if he doesn't give it back? Um, <laughs> so there's all kinds of problems here. So what they're very much afraid of is they want Jane Stanford. She's living a very long life, but they're always afraid when she dies, if she doesn't change things beforehand, there's going to be a challenge to the will. But before this, there's an even greater danger. Jane Stanford contemplates taking the entire endowment and Stanford University and turning it over to the Catholic Church. She would make it essentially a branch of Santa Clara University. The Jesuits would run it. Because she thinks under David Starr Jordan, students are running wild, particularly female students. She goes into a sexual panic in the early 20th century. She's, uh, she wants to banish female students from Stanford, though that had been one of the things that set the university apart. Right. Excuse me, apart. It was founded with freedom, uh, yeah. both right away, which was highly unusual. It was. Yeah. And so and she, she, she was tired of it already. She was tired of it, but also it's written into the endowment. It's written into the constitutional amendment. She can't do that. Yeah. So they're, they're afraid of, of this, doing this stuff. And as Jordan is opposed to her, she's also decided she wants to fire David Starr Jordan. Yeah. yeah. So that's the uncertainty at the university. Now let's go into the household, <laughs> where, where she runs roughshod off or, over a, a, a whole set of characters. Uh, very interesting. And uh, you can pick them out if you want. Maybe, maybe speak about Ah Ting for a little while or the, the, the Chinese. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it, I mean, it's, at this point, it begins to sound like an Agatha Christie novel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because there's Ah Wing, who is her oldest Chinese servant. And Ch ah Wing has been with the family for a very long time has been very loyal to the Stanfords. And what she'll do is take another one of Jane Stanford's Lathrop brothers, who's dying of cirrhosis of the liver, comes into the mansion to live. Ah Wing nurses him through his last days, is very kind to him. He's the one who takes care of him. The brother promises that he will give Ah Wing um, money in his will. When he dies, um, Ah Wing gets nothing. And Ah Wing is furious. The money goes to Jane Stanford. Ah Wing decides, that's it, I'm going back to China. Convoluted story. Jane Stanford persuades him when he does visit his family, if he comes back and stays with her till she dies, there will be, an endow there will be money for him in her will. And there is. Ah Wing doesn't know how much, and it'll turn out not to be much money, but Ah Wing knows that when Jane Stanford dies, he can get the money and go back to his family in China. So Ah Wing is one of the servants. Um, there's also a, bu a, a butler named Albert. Uh -huh. <laughs> of course, there's Always a butler. <laughs> there's, and his name is Albert Beverly. And of course, he's English. And he's about six feet one tall for the time. Um, and he had led an interesting life before he gets to Jane Stanford. He had been the butler for Lily Langtree, who had been um, a famous actress. So she's not an actress. She's really the lover of the Prince of Wales and is notorious for affairs in both the United States and um, Europe. She's the first woman famous for being famous. So to move from Lily Langtree to Jane Stanford is about as far as you can go um, in the world. Of, of butlerdom in the early 20th century. But, but he comes in there, but he brings a series of English habits. And one of the habits is, is that he's entitled to take um, kickoffs from, or 
get money from merchants. What he will do is when they buy things, either when they're traveling or when they buy supply for the houses, the merchants will overcharge. And what they'll do is they'll send in a bill for um, a certain amount which will allow Beverly to skim off money. And he shares that money with Bertha Burner. So both of them are skimming the books. Bertha Burner has to approve the books. Beverly's the one who's um, setting up the purchases. So both of them are taking money off the top from Jane Stanford. They're embezzling from her. They're also, at the time, rumored to be, and uh, I'm almost certain it is true, lovers. So he's another one. And he's a, he, people are saying, well, he got caught, and so he becomes the suspect either for revenge or for something else. So he becomes another one. He is also, there's an English maid, I could go on forever, but there's, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> there's an English maid called Elizabeth Richmond who is close friends with Beverly and Beverly's wife. She seemed to be eccentric. Um, she seemed to be a rival of Berners. She falls under suspicion. She's a woman who will keep telling stories and changing the stories, which is not such a good thing to do when you're dealing with private detectives and police. Every, <laughs> every time you see her, the story has changed. Yeah. All right. So that's, that's the main set of characters in the household. And so there's all kinds of tensions, as you say. Uh, Bertha comes and goes because she's been fired and, and then rehired and fired and rehired. Um, so we get to the beginning of 1905. And something's found in, in a glass, which, yeah. yeah. So there's a first, first thing that happens. Yeah, it, it happens up the street. It happens yeah. um, up in Knob Hill, um, where the Stanford Mansion was, which was be destroyed by the, by the earthquake. Um, and she, there's the Stanford Mansion. I mean, it, it, these look like small villages. Um, and that's it's like what the Union Pacific Club, right? <laughs> yeah, it's right. Just right like it, that one. Yes, yeah, it's, yeah. it's right where it, it, it's up there now. And Jane Stanford lived in that house alone with Bertha Burner. Most of the time, Burner hadn't lived with her. But 1905, Bertha Burner is there. And Bertha Burner resents it because her own mother is dying. And Bertha Burner wants to be with her mother. But Jane Stanford insists that she accompany Jane Stanford. So Jane Stanford goes to bed in her bedroom, which is um, on the upper floors. And um, she takes Poland Spring bottled water, which still exists. Right. I mean, it's, I was going to bring the bottle as a prop, but one of, my, <laughs> one of my children actually drank it, so I don't have the bottle anymore. Um, so Poland Spring bottled water. She pours the water, and she takes her drink before she goes to bed, and she immediately gags, spits it out, and screams for her maid, Elizabeth Richmond. Um, there's something floating in the water. The water tastes bitter. Um, she throws up. And Elizabeth Richmond will take the bottle down to a chemist um, at, a, at a drugstore who will then send it out for analysis. And it turns out that there is strychnine in the water. But it's a particular kind of strychnine. Somebody has point, poured rat poison into the water. Somebody has tried to poison Jane Stanford. This is in January of 1905. Yeah. So, and then... Do they, do they go to the police? Do they have it investigated? No, no, no. You're rich in San Francisco. <laughs> you, you don't go to the police. The last thing Jane Stanford wants is all over the newspapers, which eventually she will get, that Jane Stanford has been poisoned in her bedroom. You go to a private detective. They bring in a private detective, um, and the lead detective is going to be Jules Callenden, who's the one who will take over this case. And Jules Callenden has two jobs. First job is to keep this quiet. The second job is to try to figure out how rat poison got into Jane Stanford's um, bottled water. Yeah. So they don't come up with a conclusion about who did that and so on and so forth, and time goes by, but not that much time goes by. No, not that much time goes by. Callan is really good at um, covering up the story for a while, not very good at finding out who the murderer is. And, what, and when, in fact, it leaks out because he's pay, they put too much pressure on Elizabeth Richmond, so the story hits the papers, they then change the story. There was no poisoning. There was no rat poison in the water. They have the chemist's report. They're lying. They know there's rat poison in the water. And Jane Stanford knows it. And Jane Stanford has left and gone down to San Jose um, because she can't bear to be in, in the mansion with somebody trying to poison her. So then she's gotten given advice um, that she should go away for a while. And she's going to go to L.A., but it turns out it's a bad winter in L.A. And she decides she loves Hawaii. She's going to go to Hawaii. So instead, they book a trip, and she and Bertha Burner will now go into um, 
take a trip to Hawaii on their way to Japan. Bertha Berner doesn't want to go. Bertha Berner's mother is dying. Her mother needs her. But at the same time, she's afraid if she doesn't go, she's not going to get money from Jane Stanford's will, for which there is a substantial amount for her, and she's going to lose her job. So Bertha Berner consents to go, all the while trying to talk Jane out Stanford out of doing it. At the same time, David Starr Jordan has clearly found out that Jane Stanford is going to fire him, and David Starr Jordan is having a nervous breakdown. Um, the night, day after the poisoning, for some, well, I know the reason, David Starr Jordan shows up at the mansion. He'd been in San Francisco the night of the poisoning, which is a coincidence, <laughs> and takes, takes the train back with Jane Stanford and Bertha Berner when they eventually go back to the summer house on the Stanford campus. Yeah. So they head off to Hawaii. And how long are they in Hawaii before? <laughs> they're, they're in Hawaii. They're supposed to go to Japan. So he's going to spend a couple of weeks in Hawaii. And they're there for about a week. They're staying at the Moana Hotel, which is the fanciest hotel in Hawaii um, at the time. And Jane Stanford is gradually relaxing. She's very open about the fact of the attempt to poison her in San Francisco. She tells the other guests. Um, she's very open about her spiritualism. Um, you know, she's at this point um, pretty chatty about the whole, the whole thing. Um, <laughs> And people are sort of surprised. You don't expect the richest women in San Francisco to be sitting on the balcony saying, oh, yes, I was nearly poisoned in San Francisco. That's why I'm, <laughs> that's why I'm in Hawaii on my way to Japan. Um, but she never gets to Japan because she will go into the... Um, the hotel, and after a day in which they'd gone out to see the sights, she comes back in. They don't eat much at dinner because they'd had a big lunch. Um, and she asks Bertha Berner to prepare her bicarbonate of soda. And with that, she'll take her bicarbonate, and she takes another pill, which is for her digestion. The pill contains a tiny amount of strychnine, which is used for um, all kinds of remedies in the early 20th century, but not nearly enough to do anybody any harm. Um, she takes the pill, and she goes... She actually doesn't take the pill, excuse me. She has the pill set by her bed, and she goes to bed, and Bertha Berner goes to her room, and another maid goes to the same room. And in the middle of the night, the guests are woken up by Jane Stanford screaming. Um, Jane Stanford has taken the bicarbonate, apparently woken up in the middle of the night, remembered, taken it, and again, she had a bitter taste in her mouth, but this time it's too late. She has swallowed it down with water. They get the hotel doctor, the hotel doctor comes, and she tells the doctor, I've been poor. Poisoned. I've been poisoned again. Um, I was poisoned in San Francisco, and um, you have to get a stomach pump. They, ha they call for a stomach pump, but they're a hotel in Hawaii. Stomach pumps aren't part of the net equipment. It takes a while for the pump to get there. Jane Stanford doesn't have a long time to go. It takes about 10 minutes, and her last words are going to be, um, this is a terrible death to die. She dies with all of the, when you die of strychnine poisoning, the signs are very, very clear. From your body arching to your feet taking a certain way um, to your inability to swallow. Um, Jane Stanford, the doctors identify right away, this is strychnine or I've never seen strychnine. And she's dead. And one of the interesting things about it, it's not rat poison this time. No, this time it's not rat poison. Somebody, either it's a different poisoner, which I don't think is the case, or somebody learned an awful lot about strychnine in the, several, <laughs> in the following three weeks. This is pure strychnine, which is hard to get. To get strychnine, you have to sign for it. And so if it's not signed for, you either have a contact who can get you strychnine or some other way of avoiding having to sign the poison book. Because they go through all the poison books in San Francisco, they can find nobody who has bought pure strychnine of the kind that killed Jane Stanford, at least nobody who doesn't have a perfectly good alibi. So there's all this you know, contention between at the university with Jane and with her household staff and with Jane. And now we come to the contention between the Hawaiian authorities and the San Francisco authorities. Yeah. Why don't you tell a little bit about that story? Yeah, the Ho Hawaiian authorities have called a coroner's jury. And it's true that they sort of mess things up. They're not, they're not really good at murder in Hawaii. There aren't that many murders in Hawaii at the same time. And so they constitute the coroner's jury with people who should have been witnesses and other things. But it's a coroner's jury. Coroner's jury hears very good evidence from doctors. They hear the evidence from the autopsy. Um, and the coroner's jury concludes that she died of strychnine poisoning at the hands of a person or persons unknown. Um, so th they turn it over to the police, and the police start looking. But Hawaii is still a territory. It's not a state. You know, th 
<laughs> you don't want a very rich woman dying in Hawaii. This is going to be really expensive. Um, <laughs> So what they try to do is say, this is a case for the San Francisco police. This isn't really a case for us. So both sides are trying to turn it over, but the Hawaiian police know a murder when they see one. They just don't want to pay the expenses of having to solve the murder. And it's at that point that um, the police from San Francisco will show up. They've now been informed that Jane Stanford was poisoned in San Francisco and have started investigating that with no success. But now the police come, Jules Callendon, the private detective, comes, and David Starr Jordan and one of the trustees come. They all take the ship together to come out to Hawaii. Yeah. So how often does the president of the university go you know, to, to a murder uh, situation? Like Especially when the person who's been murdered is the person who's trying to fire you when you're there. So um, <laughs> David Starr Jordan is showing up. It's not as if they had been this real close friends. But David Starr Jordan shows up because he says he's there just to bring the body home. He has nothing to do with the murder, no investigation of the murder. He's not going to interfere with any of that. He's just there to bring the body home. Right. And? Um, they bring the body home, they bring, and, and then San Francisco... Uh, but before they bring the body home, yeah. David Starr Jordan hires his own doctor. And David Starr Jordan hires a doctor who has not seen the body, was not at the autopsy, never examines any of the things. He takes a bunch of material, which by interviewing Bertha Berner, by interviewing a couple of other people, and by information from David Starr Jordan, decides that um, she had not died of strychnine poisoning. What she had died of was indigestion. Um, she had eaten soggy gingerbread at um, the picnic the day before. This had caused um, gas. Um, the gas had put pressure on her heart. The pressure on her heart had caused her to panic, and that had triggered a heart attack. So. This is a common diagnosis for women dying for all kinds of things or having medical problems in the early 20th century. She was hysterical. Mm -hmm. And so there had been no poisoning. It was a heart attack. There's nothing to investigate. There had been no murder. Now, why would David Starr Jordan want that non-murder sort of situation? We, we talked about it a little bit, but, but you make it perfectly clear. Yeah. Um, David Starr Jordan is there. He's conferring at the same time with a guy named Mountford Wilson, who's another one of Jane Stanford's lawyers. Um, and he's been conferring with um, the Morse Detective Agency and Jules Callendon. They are really up against a hard place with um, Jane Stanford's death, Stanford University, and the Lathrop family. If Jane Stanford was murdered, that is going to lead to a trial. The trial is going to lead to all kinds of publicity about Stanford University, including her desire to um, fire David Starr Jordan, the quarrels within the university. This is not going to be good for the university. They have suicide, and they sort of float that one, but suicide is even worse, because if she committed suicide, suicide is going to be an occasion for overturning the wills, because by definition in the early 20th century, if you commit suicide, you're mentally unstable and incapable of actually drafting these kinds of legal documents, especially when the spiritualism comes up. For everybody concerned, including the murderer, um, it's best that Jane Stanford died of natural causes. But there is the inconvenient first poisoning. What are the chances that somebody's poisoned twice and it's by strychnine and it's not murder? So even after David Starr Jordan gets this report, the Hawaiian police don't buy it. They say, this is outrageous. All you came here to do was to upend our investigation. He still has to have the San Francisco police cooperate. He says, the San Francisco police say they're going to look into this very carefully. They look into it for five hours and decide she dies a natural death. <laughs> Case closed. Um, Stanford University gets all the money, takes some operation by Crothers. Charles Lathrop gets a million dollar inheritance. He quiets the rest of the family. Um, and things go on, and Jane Stanford becomes, in Stanford lore, the good woman. Nobody had any reason to kill her. She was died in her, in her old age of a heart attack. Um, and there is nothing more to the story than that. It's amazing how all those different groups, all, all the internal fighting, uh, were all brought together onto the same page of hushing the whole thing up um, very quickly. 
Very quickly, the only ones, there's going to be one, some Stanford relatives who don't buy it at all, and they'll offer a reward, but nothing comes of that. And one newspaper editor, Fremont Older, will insist that this will, must be investigated. But remember, there's still pressure, and the pressure goes on. There's something fishy about this story. There's something fishy about the cover-up, because they recognize Jordan is covering things up. But this is, now she dies in 1905, 1906, the earthquake. Police records are destroyed. Morse Detective Agency records are destroyed. A lot of documents are destroyed. And besides that, San Francisco has bigger problems than worrying about who murdered a very rich elderly woman in Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> a very easy, uncomplicated story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll leave it at that. Um, it, it, it seems that whatever, you know, whoever was actually involved, as, as we said earlier, it could have been one of 20 people uh, who actually did it. And I, I think you do a great job. Uh, one of the interesting things about the book uh, from a detail point of view is showing what the, where the evidence lead, who's the most likely person who actually did that, and then, and then et cetera, why, why things happened. Um, even though it would seem like David Starr Jordan was right at the top of the list, that's not where you landed. So at least Stanford has got that going for it, that their first president didn't murder <laughs> yeah. their, their uh, original cash source. Um. <laughs> yeah, my, my other problem is at first I thought naively, I'll just find the person who's lying. They're all lying. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about uh, a couple of big issues. And then if there are any questions from the audience, if you could, you, could, uh, you know, pass them up, or, or if you'd like to ask them directly. I don't know if we have a mic for that, um, but we'll get to that. So here's one example from the late 19th century, the early 20th century. There are plenty of other ones like that, too, and then other times and places where an institution that's now famous and, and an extremely important part of, in this case, the Bay Area and even the United States and even the world, Stanford University, uh, ha has a very unhealthy start. You know, if you, you look at Yale, and, and uh, in the guy, Elihu Yale, who started Yale, was a pirate, basically. Um, and he, he was, like, friends with Blackbeard or something like that. And Blackbeard, you know, was, was uh, punished, and he wasn't punished, and he founded Yale instead. And that's, there's a lot of stories like that. The interesting part about this that was, you know, slightly different was the, the attempt to turn it into a spiritualist university. I mean, there are universities, like, or Roberts, I mean, based totally on a, on, on a religious idea. But Harvard and Yale also, and, and plenty of the other old schools, got started as part of a religion, and then eventually went secular when, when science became the main thing. So what did, you, what did you take away from all this about how institutions start, how they grow, what's the crucial thing? Did you think about any of that? Because, as you said, it was, it was kind of an accident after World War II that Stanford became the university that they had at least theoretically thought. Um, is it all accident, or does, does, do people take over? Uh, Post-World War II is not an accident. Stanford's a lot of planning, but I'll push that part aside okay. to, go back to, the, to go back to the early part. Um, universities are not ivory towers. I mean, very often, anybody who works in a university and hears the people say, oh, professors, they just live in an ivory tower. They don't have to um, live in the world we live in. <laughs> has never been in a university. Um, <laughs> universities are a product of their time. They're influenced very much by the world around them. California in the early 20th century was Gilded Age California. It was a very corrupt place. Stanford was a very corrupt university. All the ideas floating around in um, and all the politics floating around um, San Francisco and California had an impact on Jane Stanford. When Jane Stanford's murdered, I mean, the genius, I guess, of Stanford University is they managed to turn a founding by somebody who essentially embezzled money to make a fortune, cheated people right and left, including the government, and a woman who becomes a spiritualist and is murdered into an uplifting tale. <laughs> And the uplifting tale is one that works really well, particularly as the Silicon Valley develops. We need rich people. Rich people get this money, and maybe you shouldn't look that closely at how they got it, 
But in the end, what they do is they give this money to universities and other institutions, and this works for the good of everyone. It works for the good of um, children of California. Stanford University becomes a great university. And that all we do is we tell the story. And if any of you have taken the Stanford tours behind the undergraduate walking backward, you get a variation of this, of how this fortune comes in. It's founded a, a great university. And it, the, all of the pieces go together. And the, and the moral of the story is, and if you ever get a fortune by going to Stanford University, you know where that money should come back to, too. <laughs> and we will put your name on a building. They're all over there. Nobody, nobody going to forget, except poor David Starr Jordan, who had his name taken off the building. Right. Um, um, so this is, you know, this becomes a story. The founding story works really well. It's about how great wealth leads to great good. And that's a story Stanford likes to tell. Yeah. Uh, a lot of institutions like, like that, that story, too. Um, so why don't we uh, take a look at all the pictures? We have a couple of other pictures uh, of the family and stuff like that, now that their story has been told. <coughs> oh, yeah, that's a fine one. Yeah. Now, this... This is actually, when I didn't look at this closely enough, this is a backdrop. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that, yeah. <laughs> Which, um, the part that it's amazed nice. me is... I, I like that, yeah. yeah. I like that when I saw it, I said, yeah. But they bring the camels into the studio, so I like that part, right. too. That's Jane Stanford um, down in front. Off to my left here is Elizabeth Richmond sitting there, who looks like a proper English maid. The man in the derby is uh, Albert Beverly. Um, and next butler. to him, the butler, and Beverly... Uh, Beverly is sitting next to Bertha Berner, who is, um, at this time, almost certainly his lover, um, though they're going to have a falling out later. Um, and those were Egyptians to hire, to handle the camels, sitting in the picture, too. Yeah. And, and as you said, this is a backdrop picture, so it's not much you know, different than today when you, yeah. you get a picture with Donald Trump in a cardboard version. <laughs> so that's, that's, the, the, that's her family of servants, but the ones that she spent all of her time with, and all four of them are our are, are main uh, possible culprits. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, uh, next picture. What, what else? We have, we have some family pictures, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is Leland Jr. That's Jane Stanford, and that's Leland Sr. Um, and so this is, this is a family. This is literally, Stanford University comes from this. As I, you know, I've, I've talked to students about it when I've done my own campus tours for other classes. If Leland Stanford Jr. had not died, Stanford University would just be another patch of suburbs sweeping south. Um, Stanford University exists because of his death. No, Leland looks kind of an upright gentleman to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, I'm just kidding. He looks like, like he's planning something. <laughs> <laughs> the boy looks fine. <laughs> Next picture. We have, we have a couple more, right? We, be we, can repeat, we can repeat some of the other ones. Yeah, yep, okay. Okay, you can That's just the go past. He, he, the, he, the brothers have a, a, a family resemblance. They've, There's no question. Yeah, they have good heads of hair, all the Stanford yeah, yeah. stuff. <laughs> okay, great. So, are there any questions from the audience uh, that want to find out about it? Okay, great. Yeah, um, I'm curious. Uh, since Stanford University hasn't really acknowledged this part of its history, when you decided to start writing this book, were any uh, people at the school a little unhappy with you? Um, which, I mean, there's a, I was talking to a reporter from The Examiner who... Um, asked the good question, which I wondered how long it would take somebody to ask. Stanford has made no response to the book at all. Yeah. Um, she said, I'd like to write a story about Stanford's response to the book. And I said, it's going to be a really short story. <laughs> um, and, and I told her, what Stanford is going to do is what Stanford and other institutions always do to these kinds of embarrassing scandals. It'll go away. Just say nothing. Let it go away. Um, she's now writing the story anyway. I'll be interesting to see what they say. But so far, um, Stanford has utterly ignored it. Um, I, I would be shocked if they even changed the script on their tours. Um, but I, you know, so far, and certainly Stanford, it is, you know, it's, it's a legitimate academic institution. Nobody ever told me I couldn't write the book. Nobody um, denied me access to the archives. I will say there was... 
more stuff missing in the archives than any research project I've ever done before, but I was never des um, denied access to anything. The archivists were, I could not speak more highly of them. Um, so I was not prevented from doing this at all. And, uh, but let's talk about the, what David Starr Jordan did to professors who he didn't like, you know, because that was a, pre before Stanford became a professional university and there was the Ross affair and you talked about that. Yeah, he, he drove them out. I mean, he drove out, you know, there's the Ross affair, there's the Gilbert affair. I mean, what David Starr Jordan would do, the, the best example of David Starr Jordan's um, techniques is a, a librarian, and it's this, this sort of seedy Amer academic scandal. Charles Gilbert had been, he actually, Jordan first taught high school, Gilbert was his high school student. Gilbert followed him to Indiana University, then he followed him to, to um, Stanford University, and Gilbert was middle-aged, and having an affair with an ex-student in the library. And the library, one of the librarians caught them. And so there was, became a scandal, particularly among the students. And so what the word came back up to David Starr Jordan, who did not want Gilbert to have any trouble. So he turned on the librarian. And what he did with him, this is early 20th century um, San Francisco, he said that the librarian was an invert. Invert was um, a word that meant they didn't have the word gay in early 20th century. So whether in fact he was gay or not, I don't know. But he said in fact he was, um, he was an invert and that he should be put into an asylum. And that unless he got on a train, as this another faculty member did it to him, unless he got on a train, Jordan had a doctor who was saying that this guy should be put into custody, put in a hospital, and essentially locked up. He got on a train and went to work for the Smithsonian Institution. David Jordan was not a nice man. Yeah, yeah. The current president has a totally different personality, and <laughs> you're not worried about getting put on a train. I'm no, I'm not going to be on a train. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How old was Jane Stanford when she actually died? She was, um, it's a very good question. I think she was 77. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that why you were willing to write the book? <laughs> you, you, you already had tenure and you're retired, right? I retired, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a double whammy as a professor <laughs> anyway. Uh, other questions? Wait for the mic so that we can get it recorded. Is there anybody else that would like to ask a question? Okay, great. Thanks, Dan. Yes, you indicated that you know, the archival material had been destroyed in the 1906 earthquake. So what was there left? What was the most useful resources that well, your students were able to find? No, the material had been destroyed. It was not destroyed in the earthquake. Um, Stanford really didn't have an archives initially. I mean, Leland Stanford, when he founded the university, destroyed his papers for good reason. They, they pretty much were incriminating. Um, <laughs> And the other trustees were businessmen who did not keep those kinds of records. So, in fact, it took a while to actually get a Stanford archives. The archives, as we know it to now, develops after um, the earthquake. So Crothers' papers come from Crothers' collection. He lost some in his San Francisco offices in the earthquake. They come in. There are other records that weren't on campus at the time. So a lot of those records are collected later. The records I'm talking about are things and gaps in the collection where I find... Jenny Lathrop, who's Jane Stanford's niece, who she, it's a, well, I won't go into that story. <laughs> <They're> all, <laughs> anyway, she had started a book about Jane Stanford, and she got sick and donated her papers and the manuscript to Stanford University. I have the letter. I have the letter from the president saying they'd received it. Disappeared. Stanford hired another doctors to do an autopsy on what was left of Jane Stanford. There wasn't much left of her after the first autopsy. And they wrote up a report which was Stanley Cutler, who's somebody, a doctor who looked at it, tore apart um, from this, the second-hand accounts. The first-hand account of that autopsy utterly disappeared. Um, that's all gone, too. The Morris records, Collendon, Collendon was writing to the trustees and writing to Mountford Wilson. All that stuff's gone. It's just gone. But you know, it's one of the things I talk about in the book. It's really hard to destroy records. I mean, people try all the time, but if you destroy the letter copy you wrote, the letter went to somebody, they still have it. 
um, you write a report and somebody read the report, there are other counts of the report. It's really hard to destroy evidence. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I always watch things like the current congressional hearings, as you find out, you know, no matter how hard you try to erase this stuff, there's just embarrassing <laughs> stuff left behind. You were probably better off keeping everything. <laughs> You mentioned the autopsy, and there wasn't much left after the first autopsy. It's a little gruesome detail, but what they did to demonstrate that there was strychnine and to prove yeah. it was really quite amazing. Yeah. Well, it was the, an amazing little detail. Yeah, yeah because they basically they, they didn't have blenders at the time, but they took Jane Stanford's insides, put it in a blender, and then did a test on it. Yeah. And, and it, that was the way to test for strychnine at the time. Yeah. Yeah. They were just they developing these they tests. They don't do that anymore, right? I, no, I'm hoping they have better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Uh, oh, sorry. I, I just have a quick question. Um, so you talked a little bit about David Starr Jordan, and now they renamed Jordan Hall. Can you, I mean, um, and so I guess this is kind of going back to that question about Stanford University response to your book, but also its response to David Starr Jordan and his sort of eugenics view, which is like what, what sort of brought down the name, I mean, which is the controversy now. So I don't know if you wanted to talk about Jordan and his eugenicism and also like how Stanford has responded to some of that. Yeah, Stanford responded. I mean, Stanford, you know, I have no inside knowledge of this. I was um, asked when they were putting together the committee to look at the history of Stanford. But as soon as they formed a committee to look at the history of Stanford with no historians on it and, um, mm -hmm. own, and largely lawyers, I became very, I didn't have much interest in, <laughs> in participating in this so-called investigation. Um, so what they did do is they do, they you know, it's like Casablanca. David Starr Jordan was an eugenicist. I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> they were all eugenicists. I mean, you can make this scandal going away by saying we don't approve of eugenics, which of course they don't approve of eugenics. Right. It's the same way that's happening with slavery now. We don't approve of slavery, so we're getting rid of the names. The other stuff that goes on at Stanford, if you get rid of David Starr Jordan for being a eugenicist, you don't look at the common beliefs of the faculty at the time. David Starr Jordan takes the fall. You don't look at David Starr Jordan and academic freedom. You don't look at David Starr Jordan and covering up the murder of Jane Stanford. All those things can be shifted aside. And the great irony of the whole thing is, is having written this, having removed David Starr Jordan's name, they, took, they also renamed Sarah Way, named after Father Unipero Sarah, who, is, who Jane Stanford idolized because she was going to convert to Catholicism at one point, um, and you rename it Jane Stanford Way. So <laughs> it makes no sense. They might, they might have to change that again. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Hi. Um, I was introduced to the idea that Jane Stanford was murdered when I read the book Why, um, Why Fish Don't Exist by Lulu yeah, Miller. Lulu Miller, she's great. Yeah, and I just wonder if you could speak to that book leaves one really suspicious of David Starr Jordan, and I guess you found other information, but I just wondered if you'd speak to what she, she wrote. Yeah, um, you know, it, she was, first of all, writing a book about David Starr Jordan, <laughs> so he, and he is suspicious. There's no doubt. He's one of my <laughs> suspects. And, and, and um, Lulu Miller is terrific, and when she was doing the book, she came and I turned her over all my papers from the students um, and everything else. So she had a lot of materials before I started investigating much of it myself. So she has perfectly good reason to be very suspicious of David Starr Jordan. I was very suspicious of David Starr Jordan. But you're going to have to read the book <laughs> to figure out <laughs> who I thought really did it. Any last questions? We have time for one or two more questions. Um, yeah, so for a long time, Bertha Berner's biography was basically the only comprehensive account of what happened. And based on the research you've done, I just wanted to hear how reliable you felt her account was ultimately. Um, you know, her account's interesting for a variety of things. She was clearly working off a lot of papers. Bertha Berner writes the book in the 1930s, and she can describe an afternoon she spends with Jane Stanford in Paris in the 1890s with where they went, what they ate, who they saw. You don't retain that in memory. You know, you're clearly writing off of a journal or letters or something else. All of Bertha Berner's letters, journals, and she had papers disappeared um, at her death. And for a long time, what I went through is reading the, the um, 
biography and seeing what Bertha Berner said and knowing I had records from the time and said she's, she's lying. And people at the time said she's lying. And I realized that is the best way to throw me off track because I knew she lied, so I went to disprove the lies. What I didn't pay any attention to were the things Bertha Berner never talked about at all. So most of my investigation goes around things which Bertha Berner doesn't lie about. She just never says at all, and they're critical to the mystery. So Bertha Berner's book ends up being quite complicated. Um, and in a way, you know, I came to have some sympathy for Bertha Berner. She's um, a woman of the period where, in fact, she had a choice. It was not a place where she could have a career, travel the world, and be um, married, unless she marries a rich man. Bertha Berner ends up being um, a single woman who's an independent woman, who takes care of her mother, who lives the life um, where she gets to travel the world with Jane Stanford, but at the same time, she's a woman um, who spends much of her life being torn between two elderly women, Jane Stanford and her own mother. Um, so she's a complicated person. There was one little detail, I don't know if we want to bring it up or not, but I thought one of the things that you uncovered was uh, when you mentioned earlier that pure strychnine was pretty hard to get, that you kind of noticed that there was a chemist that could possibly have done that. Now, maybe we would just leave that one little detail out there, but there, there's real, real yeah. you know, you, you dug up some things that make it clearer, uh, clearer anyway, yeah, I what's mean, likely. Because one of the things I thought, I thought, you know, these police are so inept. I mean, they're, <laughs> they're just these obvious clues that nobody pursues. Why don't they do this? Why don't they do that? Um, and I realized they did do it. Mm. They knew who murdered Jane Stanford. And they knew how it happened. But it was completely useful to ignore that fact. Yeah. And if it hadn't been for a couple of small lines in a newspaper story that was just thrown away, I think it was the Chronicle, I can't remember the paper, I never would have noticed it. Um, and then I thought, wait a minute. So. Yeah. Well, uh, so one last question. Over here. How, do you have, have a you question? Have one over here? Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how do you, Professor, how do you, how do you account for critical papers disappearing over long periods of time from archives? Okay, there's, there's a couple of explanations. The first, the least suspicious ones, I've worked in archives my whole life. Papers disappear all the time. They're misfiled. Um, they might still be there. They're someplace else. But I didn't think that was the case because some papers which didn't disappear had been taken out from the folders they should have been in chronological order and placed in separate folders. But that's, you know, that's, that's a minor part. The other part is that um, certain things, I have no explanation except that they were culled. Um, I do not know who culled them. They were not the modern archivists who culled them. I've worked at Stanford Archives for 25 years, and um, the archivists meet the highest standards. I trust all of them. And what I will tell you is I heard stories. Mm -hmm. But I am a historian, and I don't have evidence to prove those stories. <laughs> so at that point, where if I started to tell you what I thought was going on, it would just simply be gossip. But I am pretty certain that somebody, or more than one person, culled some of those papers. Others I know, Jane Stanford destroyed part of Leland's papers. Bertha Berner probably destroyed her own papers, but I'm not sure of that. All I can tell you is that those papers existed at a certain point well after the death of Jane Stanford and then disappeared. So that I don't step on any other questions. Is there another one out there? It's kind of hard to see. Somebody else have? Yeah. Okay. One last question. Here comes Dan. Hi, I'm an archivist. <laughs> <laughs> My hero. So. <laughs> no, I. Um, when it, archivists operate according to a, a code of ethics, professional code of ethics, and maybe university presidents don't. <laughs> um, but. You can trust archivists. One thing you can't trust oftentimes are researchers. <laughs> yeah. They secrete things out. Um, and many times in archives that have really valuable things, not just informational content, but things of value, uh, they literally frisk you coming in and going out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because, 
and, and the most suspect people for potentially removing things from archives are researchers who know the value of what they're looking at. Uh, no, uh, I'm not impugning your reputation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, Leave you you are I, not one of the suspects. I was going to say, we have a new suspect in this room. Yeah. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, because I've been a historian for a very long time, um, I've been acquainted with some historians who were kleptomaniacs and got caught. Um, that, that happened. I was, I was astonished they could get away with it. But you're perfectly right, things go out of there. And what I'm talking about is stuff without any monetary right. value. And I'm talking sometimes about like Bertha Bernie's papers, which must have been a substantial collection, which never made it to the archives. Um, I'm talking about other things like um, the Lathrop papers that disappeared would be, you know, substantial and just maybe they got misfiled. But the thing is, is that the archivists, um, at least the archivists I've known, modern archivists, you're, you're perfectly right. They're, they're very, very responsible. And um, there's some libraries I've worked in where the archivists clearly didn't trust me. <laughs> <laughs> and it took me a very long time to get to see things. I mean, it's the first piece of advice I, give to my, I gave to my graduate students, which is, the archivist has to be your friend. <laughs> Don't ever do anything that's going to make an archivist angry at you. Take an archivist out to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think then one final question, which is, you don't have like a grandfather or a great grandfather that you wrote out of the story, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> My grandfather wasn't a fan of federal penitentiary, but well, <laughs> he didn't even come to this country until after Jane Stanford was dead. So he's, <laughs> okay, he's clear. That, that's safe. Perfect. So, uh, any, any final words? I mean, the one, one last thing that I wanted to ask you about actually was, do you think, I mean, you're a historian, so you're looking at the past, but when you read the papers and you pay attention to what's going on right now, do you think things are substantially different or, or, or about the same level of... of hiding things and pushing things aside, or, or, whether, or whether they were just really active at it before? Well, it's, I mean, I've written a big book on the Gilded Age in the late 19th, early 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been argument among historians whether we're in the new Gilded Age. I know which side of that argument I'm on. We're in a new Gilded Age. I mean, many of the things that I wrote about in that book are still very much, or not very much, not still, are once again a large part of American society. Um, but you know, there haven't been any university founders murdered recently that I know of. And, <laughs> and Jane Stanford was not the only one of them to die <laughs> in the early 20th century. And, and in our current Gilded Age, not as many live in butlers either. No. Well, I don't know that. I, it's not a social class that I move among, so I really can't say much. Well, thank you very much, Richard. That was a, a great, uh, you know, peek into it. And uh, you can find out who he thinks did it. Uh, read. Who Killed Jane Stanford? Uh, Richard White, a great historian. 10, 15 other books. Um, thanks a lot for coming back to the Commonwealth Club and sharing this one with us. It's always a pleasure. Thanks, Steve. Thank you.